Welcome back everybody, good to see you again and really excited for this last episode on Esther. Esther landed up being a lot longer than I thought she would be. I kind of envisioned sort of three and this is now five. But um, all the things that I, I wanted to share, you know, and so I'm going to endeavor to wrap it all up in this episode because otherwise we're going to be going on and on and on about this. So we are in the final act of the play. We are in the final, the final vindication of the Jewish people. We are in chapter nine of the book of Esther and we are in the 12th month. The biblical month of Adar. And you know, the month of Adar is the month of joy. And so that was the month where the Jewish people were supposed to all be slaughtered. And it was actually the month where God vindicated them and he reversed the curse and turned things completely around. And I just wanted to read some of what it says in that chapter 9, um, where it says, that the king's command and his edicts were about to be executed on the very day that the enemies on the very day that the enemies of the Jews had planned for a massacre of them it was turned to the contrary and the Jews had rule over those who hated them and then it speaks about how the Jews gathered together in the cities throughout the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on such as sought their hurt and no man could withstand them, for the fear of them had fallen upon all the peoples. And I just want you to see that when it speaks about the ones that hated them, the ones who had sought their hurt, so that you understand that it wasn't like a wholesale slaughter. You know, the Jews didn't just go and massacre anyone who kind of they thought it would be nice to do so. It was the people who hated them, the people who sought their hurt, the people who had risen up because of the original edict from the king, which was still in place. The Jewish people defended themselves and they then took up arms against those people. So it wasn't just, you know, killing willy-nilly. Um, and it says that all the princes of the provinces and the chief rulers and the governors and they who attended to the king's business helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai had fallen upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace and his fame went forth throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai became more and more powerful. When God vindicates you, he does it wholly and completely. And it says, so the Jews smote all their enemies with the sword slaughtering and destroying them and did as they chose with those who hated them okay so it wasn't like they were you know neighbors that they'd been friends with for years they suddenly turned on it wasn't like that it was those who sought to rise up against the jewish people to hurt the jewish people those were the ones that the jews took on but i want to pay attention to one or two verses now verse 10 in chapter 9 verse 10 it says and um, so it speaks about, in chapter 6, it speaks about how in Shushan, you know, the capital itself, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men, and then they list a whole lot of the men. And then they speak about the 10 sons of Haman, son of Hamadatta, the Jews' enemy, but on the spoil they laid not their hands. And then if you look a little bit further down to um, six, um, verse 16, verse 15 and verse 16 it speaks about how the jewish people slew but on the spoil they laid not their hands and again in verse 16 they slew of them that hated them 75,000, but on the spoil they laid not their hands and this is why i feel that it is actually a valid argument that Haman was descended from the Amalekites, from the Amalekites, from um, from King Agag, because if you just go back to Samuel two verse 15, uh, Samuel two chapter fifteen, remember I said to you what was Saul supposed to do? He was supposed to destroy them all, leave none left, and not touch the spoil. He wasn't supposed to take anything from them. He wasn't supposed to benefit at all from the destruction of the Amalekites. He was supposed to simply destroy the Amalekites so that they could never bother Israel again. And he was disobedient. He didn't do that. And somehow or other, something, somewhere along the line, someone escaped and got away. And it came back to bite Israel later on, as it always does. If you read the Bible, you know, you can see how the, these things happen. And now... In this time in, in Persia, 
in this time when the Jews are destined to be massacred by the by the Persian people, the, the God turns that whole thing around and gives the Jews an opportunity to defend themselves. And the king, in the king's edict, in his decree, he stated that they could take, they were welcome to take the spoil and the plunder. That was the way it was in war. You know, when you over when you took over a country or when you, you know you took the spoil, the riches. But it says at least three times in chapter nine that on the spoil they laid not their hands and and to me that just says that God is reversing the curse not just reversing the curse of the of the the fact that um, the Jews were about to be massacred this genocide was about to happen he's not just reversing that curse he's actually reversing a curse that was put into effect how many however many years before when Saul had disobeyed him because if Haman was descended from the Amalekites, if he was a somehow descendant of King Agag, and he, because he was an Agagite, then he, if Saul had been obedient, this would never have taken place. So not only was God reversing a curse in the moment, this, the actual curse of today when the Jews were about to be massacred, but he was actually reversing a curse that began years earlier by Saul's disobedience. And he was almost like drawing a line in the sand and saying, okay, that's that. And the Jewish people did not touch the spoil. They, they didn't touch the spoil. So it wasn't about them rising up, slaughtering, you know, people willy-nilly and taking what they could. It was about them defending themselves against those who hated them. Uh, yes, against those who hated them, but they didn't touch the spoil. And then it goes on, um, quite interestingly enough, when, um, the king says to Esther, you know, the Jews have slain X amount of men in Shusha in the capital and the 10 sons of Haman, they had slain. Um, you know, what, what, what else do you want? Like, what more is your request? And she actually asks the king to let it be granted to the Jews in Shushan, the, the capital where they lived, to continue with it again the next day. So in ev everywhere else, uh, the Jews... They, they gathered together on the 14th day of Adar and, um, you know, and then they rested the next day. So the 13th day of the month of Adar. And so they gathered together on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And then on the 14th day, they rested and they feasted because their enemies had been given into their hands. But in Shushan, it went the 13th, the 14th, and then on the 15th day, they rested. And when I looked to see... Why? Like, why would she have asked for an extra day of, um, of you know, the Jews being able to defend themselves or kind of um, take people out for Shushan specifically? It seems to me that, as I said in one of the previous episodes, you know, Haman was one person, but he had 10 sons and he had a wife and he had friends and he had trusted advisors and counselors and he had risen to a position of power and he obviously had followers. So, and because it was all in Shushan, I would imagine that the the majority of his followers, the majority of the people who would have agreed with what he did, who were possibly also, who knows, maybe descended from the Amalekites, you know, I mean, um, we don't know exactly how that all happened, but so they would all have been probably concentrated in the capital of Shushan. And so it's as if Esther wants to make sure that all the, you know, that the possibility of that ever happening again is actually completely destroyed, it's completely wiped out. So she wants to completely get rid of any trace of Haman. So that's why his 10 sons are, are, are also hanged. You know, their bodies, I think, are hanged, put up somewhere. But so she wants to make sure that it is dealt with completely, that it's like you can you know, close the book and say, right, that's it, it's done. So Shushan had an extra day to deal with with the people who would have definitely followed in Haman's footsteps. And then, uh, so it says that Mordecai recorded all these things, and then he sent letters to all the Jewish people who were in the provinces, who were in all the pro provinces of the king Ahasuerus, and commanded them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day of the month of Adar yearly. 
As the days on which the Jews got rest from their enemies, and as the month which was turned for them from sorrow to gladness, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days of sending choice portions to one another, and gifts to the poor. So that is where we get Purim from. That is where the Feast of Esther comes in and the whole celebrating Purim comes from. Because the Jews undertook to do so as they had begun and as Mordecai had written. And so they called these days Purim after the name Pur, Lot, which is what happened when Haman was throwing lots to find the lucky day to destroy the Jews. And so they took the name from that actually because it turned out to be their lot that won you know the victory was actually there so that lucky day was actually not a lucky day for him at all and it was actually their day so they ordained the jews ordained and took it upon themselves and their descendants and all who joined them that without fail every year they would keep these two days at the appointed time and as it was written that these days should be remembered, imprinted on their minds, and kept throughout every generation in every family, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never cease from among the Jews, nor the commemoration of them cease among their descendants. And that is why you have Purim, which isn't a God-ordained feast. So, you know, the other, a lot of the other feasts, in fact, I think, apart from Hanukkah, all the other feasts are God-ordained feasts. But Purim is not a God-ordained feast, but it is a feast based on the remembrance of what God had done for them. It was based on the remembrance of the deliverance that God had brought for the Jewish people at this time. And that is why Purim is celebrated by the Jewish people still today. And um, it says, and then it goes on to say in the very last chapter um, of Esther, chapter 10, it says the very last verse is, basically um, a gift to Mordecai. It says, For Mordecai the Jew was next to King Ahasuerus and great among the Jews and was a favorite with the multitude of his brethren, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to his whole race. And I think to myself, like how many of us would like to get to the end of all of this, you know, and step into eternity and have that said about us, you know, that we are great, we're great amongst, amongst our people. We were a favorite with the multitude of our brethren because we sought the welfare of our people and peace for our whole races, for all our races. I mean, because... You know, it sounds like, oh, yes, I would like to be. But if you think of what they had to go through, if, of what Mordecai had to go through, of the cost that he had to count to, to be that person mentioned in this very last verse of the book of Esther, the cost he had to count in terms of sacrificing his own life, to, in terms of sacrificing the love of the one person he loved. You know, it's not that there wasn't a price paid. And it's not that there wasn't a sacrifice made. And it's not that it couldn't have gone a different way and ended very differently. God's hand was on this and this is, what, this is how it ended. But both Mordecai and Esther were prepared to lay down their lives for their nation at that time. And that is what is celebrated. So... It's easy to want to be the one to be celebrated, but are you prepared to pay the price? Is the sacrifice, are you prepared to pay the sacrifice? And I think just in looking at um, the book of Esther, and I was just looking at it in terms of kind of a, a prophetic picture, because I love to look at the prophetic picture. And, and I was kind of, Look, wondering who, you know, the, the, the main characters, um, who, who would they be in the world today? Not in terms of individuals, but as representative of, um, of, you know, what goes on in the world today. And I was kind of praying through it with God. And, you know, I've said already that to me, Mordecai was the prophet. You know, he was the prophet. He was the one who spoke the destiny of he spoke destiny over Esther and in speaking destiny over Esther encouraged her to step into the plan that God had for her and save her people 
But if he hadn't spoken that destiny, who knows what would have happened. So he prophesied something which then came to pass. But if he hadn't put that out there, who knows what would have happened. Then you have Esther herself. And I was sort of trying to, and Esther, she obviously, she steps forward, you know, as, as salvation, the salvation of the Jewish people. You know, she, she, she brings their redemption. But to me, Esther is like, so the Jewish people scattered through the land of Persia um, in exile, um, living in a world that wasn't their world, but trying to live their way, even in a world that wasn't their world. That reminds me of believers. Like that speaks to me of the church. You know, we're in exile. This isn't our final home. This isn't the place where we're supposed to be. You know, it says in the Bible, you know, we're foreigners in a foreign land. We are meant for, we, we, we live in, we're seated in heavenly places, but we're living here on earth. And we're living in a world whose customs and culture is not ours. And so the, the, the answer is not to become like them, but to maintain our own customs and cultures and belief systems, despite the fact that we live in a world that is completely the opposite. So it's that whole thing of being in the world, but not of the world. And that to me speaks of the church, of the, the greater kind of body of believers. And then Esther to me is the bride, you know, the remnant, the, the ones that are prepared to lay their lives down for the body to lay their lives down for the church, to sacrifice everything, to, to who don't count the cost, who don't, you know, who don't, I mean, I just know so many people like that, you know, who, who will give it all for Jesus. They don't, and it's not that it's not difficult. It's not that it comes easy to them. It's just that their desire, their longing, their passion for Jesus takes over everything else and nothing is as important as Jesus and his people and his sheep and and his church and Esther speaks to me of that you know that remnant of pure righteousness um, who stand up on behalf of the rest of the church of the rest of the body of believers and save them and then I was trying to figure out when it came to King Xerxes and Haman, you know, what what role they would take. And to me, King Xerxes is like the world. You know, it was almost as though he didn't know all the time what was going on exactly. He just he he just allowed Haman, who was pure evil, <laughs> you know, so you could see Haman as being the enemy, you know, the powers and the principalities that that work through the world. So Haman couldn't do any of those things on his own. He worked through King Xerxes to make those things happen. And King Xerxes was just oblivious, actually, that he was being manipulated. He was oblivious to the fact that, that this um, man was planning this thing that actually, you know, he and look, he didn't bother to inquire. He didn't bother to figure it out or he just went along with what was said. And how often does that happen in the world today? But it's like there's this more sinister kind of agenda or this more sinister presence or this more sinister, you know, behind the world. So often the actual world, the people who inhabit the world don't even know, they don't even understand the what's going on, but they just go along with the, the, the suggestions and the, the powers and the principalities that come from behind them. And so if that is the case, if we can take the, the main players in the story of Esther and, and look at them like that, you know, as Esther is of, as the bride and the Jewish people as the body of believers and um, King Xerxes as the world and Haman is the enemy and, um, and Mordecai is the prophet. You can see a correlation with the world that we live in. You can see a prophetic picture of a body of believers who needs to rise up as the bride. You can see how important it is to have prophetic voices that declare destiny over people because all of us, in the same way that Esther was a key figure in that story, if you multiply that story by, you know, until you get to the 7 billion people who are in the world, you get how many Esthers that are needed to fill, you know, to, to occupy those spaces? How many Esthers do you need for that? And therefore, how many Mordecais do you need? 
to be the one to speak, to prophesy the destiny over the Esther so that they can rise up and do that. And I just think that it is such an encouragement for us to instead of looking at, looking at it as just a story that happened a really long time ago and, you know, and yes, we all want to be Esther, but, you know, because I don't know, do we all want to be Esther? You know, we want to be the one who's, you know, this is your moment kind of thing, but do we want all the stuff that leads up to it and then all the stuff that could potentially happen afterwards? So I think that, I firmly believe that, the Bible, the old, the old Testament is not just a recording of history. It is also a prophetic statement. And however prepared you are to delve deeper into the mysteries of God is how much he will show you in terms of what is there. And it just proves the point that we need prophetic voices to declare destiny over people. And who knows, but that word that you have for that person who knows, but that word could be the, the catalyst that sends that, purpose, that person into a destiny and a purpose where they land up saving a nation. Who knows? We don't know. We speak words, we prophesy over people, we, you know, we tell people what we feel we hear God saying, or sometimes we don't because we don't want to, or we're not sure, or we don't think so. And how do we know that we are not, and it's not God, like Mordecai said, God deliverance will come for the Jews through another way if it isn't you. So it's not like if you don't bring that prophecy, that person's destiny will just remain. God always has another plan. But the point is, don't you want to be that person? You know, don't you want to be Mordecai? Don't you want to be Esther? Don't you want to be that person who, who shifts and changes the course of history? They could have, if, if Haman's plan had gone ahead, the Jewish people would be no more. It, the, the amount of Jews who lived in the land of Persia in that 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia, they would have practically wiped them out. It would have pretty much been a complete genocide. And so it wasn't, you know, that oh, they might have lost a few. They would have lost. They would have lost. And I think it's just amazing that if you look at the timeline, you look at the months that God did things in, you looked at the fact that he lined it up with Passover, you, looked, you just look at what he did and you cannot help but marvel at a God who is so much in the detail, so much in the detail. And he often paints it with broad strokes when he gives us an idea because if he gave us all the detail, we might all run a mile. But he knows every detail. And if you're looking at situations and spaces in your life and you think he's not moving, he is. He's setting things up. He's moving things into place. He's getting things going. He's, he's working behind the scenes all the time. He never stops. And if ever you needed encouragement to know that that was true, you just read the book of Esther. Because even when the Jewish people were completely oblivious to what was going to happen, they had no idea that this awful plan was going to be brought about. God already, he already knew who he was going to move into the different spaces to make sure that it didn't happen. He already knew. And everything we face in the world today, no matter how desperate it looks, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how awful and hopeless it looks, he already knows and he already is setting the stage for the final act, which will always be victory. So I want to encourage you today to not only say to the Lord that you prepared to be an Esther, but say to the Lord that you prepared to be a Mordecai as well. You are prepared to be the one who prophesies destiny over people who might then take that destiny and do incredible things. And that when your Esther moment comes, 
when there when a moment stands when a moment rises up where you know that this is your Esther moment, that this is what you were born for, that you will approach it with the same ferocious courage that Esther approached her moment, that you will step forward and say, if I perish, I perish. Because who wouldn't lay down their life for a savior who laid his own life down for us? So, I just decree and declare over you just the anointing of the Holy Spirit and a boldness like a lion and a ferocious courage like Esther and wisdom and revelation like Mordecai and prophetic strategies for warfare and absolute blessing to know who you are called to be when you are called to stand up and what you are called to do at this hour, in this time on the earth. So I bless you with that. Message me, get hold of me, let me know what you think, let me know what God has told you, let me know <laughs> testimonies of what is broken through for you in these weeks of talking about the book of Esther. And I shall see you next week. Lots of love. Bye.